Welcome back. In this video, I'll give you a quick 30,000 foot view of the issues in the financial industry and the value of some of the most prominent fintech firms. I'll start by discussing some of the biggest changes happening in the financial sector. Then I'll describe some of the biggest gaps in this sector. And then finally, I'll introduce some of the largest fintech firms and the value they provide to consumers and other firms. So what are the biggest changes impacting the financial industry? Well, here's a list that is by no means exhaustive. I'll discuss each of these issues in turn and describe how fintech is evolving to address these issues. So let's start out with the most obvious change, technological innovation. Innovation has meant that firms are now able to offer products and services that they weren't able to offer even a few years ago. We have smart devices that can communicate with the internet and provide a more user-friendly experience to consumers. A good example of this is the improvement in drone technology in the last decade, which can be used by hedge funds and other investors to predict sales revenue of firms. Several investors have famously used drones to calculate the number of vehicles sitting in parking lots and then use that data to estimate the number of customers shopping in department stores and made investment decisions based on that information. Now, one of the most important drivers of technological innovation in the last 60 years has been Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is a very famous estimation by Gordon Moore, stating that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years, though the cost of computers is halved. This has led to a massive reduction in the cost of extremely powerful microchips for years. However, Moore's Law could be coming to an end for one very important reason. Transistors are now so small that we're butting up against the size of an atom. And just for context, some of the most incredible transistors, the smallest uh, transistors are, you know, seven nanometers. Really, the smallest available transistors are three nanometers. And for context, an atom is about 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers. There are some transistors out there that are being tested in labs. So, for example, at, at Tsinghua, uh, there's some researchers out there that are developing gates or, you know, transistor gates that are literally like the size of an atom. And this is really the limit of what we should be able to achieve technologically. Okay, now there's many other technological innovations that are driving the growth of fintech. Application programming interfaces, or APIs, allow two software programs to communicate with one another. Firms can build internal APIs that link their own systems or build open APIs that allow other firms or individuals to link to their software or databases. This means that a firm like Yahoo Finance can collect data from the SEC's data repository, called EDGAR, and then provide some of that information more easily. APIs have been around for a very long time, and many fintech firms have built their entire business model around one or more APIs. APIs allow these fintech firms to draw upon a large amount of data they've already collected. This saves the fintech time and money, thus lowering costs. If you've ever used Yahoo Finance or the Federal Reserve's API, then you know how nice it is. These APIs allow users to pull data from a respectable data source at very low or no cost. All right, one final technological advance I want to mention is the rise of cloud computing. And when I say cloud computing, what I really mean is the delivery of computing services over the internet. Historically, firms, especially banks and insurance firms, store their data in-house or on private servers. However, these servers can be costly to maintain and they can take up a large amount of energy and space. They can also be significantly slower than those of a third party that focuses on maintaining servers. All of these drawbacks have led to the recent rise in cloud servers and cloud computing. With cloud servers, all of the data is stored on the server of a third party, like Amazon Web Services or AWS. A firm can access the data, but the third party maintains the data and ensures that it's backed up. The firm pays a hosting fee and might be able to request additional services from the cloud provider. Now, these cloud-based servers and computing, uh, these are rapidly increasing in popularity, and it's not hard to see why. For a set fee, you don't need to maintain servers, you can select the features you want, and you can scale up as quickly as you need. Let's say you need more server space because your business is rapidly growing, well, you just increase the amount you pay and you get additional server space. Now, there's three main players in this industry. Amazon Web Services, or AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, and Google. 
And these three players have been increasing their market share for several years now, and it's not hard to see why. They provide a very, very valuable resource. Let's talk about the next change impacting the industry, climate change. In the last few years, many large portfolio managers have had serious conversations about whether they want to include securities of firms that are damaging to the environment. Investors in many funds have noted an interest in avoiding securities issued by environmentally damaging firms. Uh, Many investors also want to avoid investing in firms that harm certain populations or have poor oversight. To measure all of these factors, some firms, like Bloomberg, have created ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Governance Metrics. ESG metrics provide a gauge for investors to determine how good or bad a firm is with respect to the environment or populations. Some firms are beginning to make decisions with not only the goal of shareholder value maximization in mind, but additional goals of supporting the local population or reducing carbon emissions. In fact, CEOs of many of the largest firms in the world have discussed moving from a shareholder value maximization objective to a stakeholder value maximization objective which focuses on maximizing the value to every stakeholder of the firm, like the firm's employees, the communities where it produces goods and services, its suppliers, and its buyers. And this is a fairly admirable goal. Now, there is a dark side to this increased focus on ESG. Despite firms and portfolio managers stating that they're refocusing and trying to improve their ESG scores or the ESG scores of their portfolio firms, most firms still have shareholder value maximization as their primary objective. This means that a lot of firms have been caught overstating how green their policies are. Firms like Google, Volkswagen, and Amazon have all been found to have overstated how environmentally friendly their operations are. This is what we sometimes call greenwashing, and it's a severe problem for investors who only want to invest in environmentally friendly firms, since it makes it difficult to tell who is trying to make their operations more environmentally friendly, and who is lying. Many fintech firms are developing apps that can address one or more issues related to climate change or ESG investment. We'll take a look at a couple of those firms in a later video. Another major shift impacting fintech is the change in demographics happening in some nations. Many developed nations are rapidly aging, while many developing nations are experiencing what demographers call a demographic dividend. This dividend refers to a very large proportion of working-age adults in the overall population. One trend you're definitely going to see in later videos is that countries with a younger population are more likely to be receptive to new technology and services provided by fintech firms. Let's take a look at three examples, the U.S., China, and Nigeria. So here is the global, what we call, population pyramid. It breaks down the global population by percentages, and you know we have blue and red for you know, f- uh, female and male. And so what you can get a sense of is there's a smaller proportion of older people, very, very old people, say 90 plus years old, and a larger proportion of people, say 5 to 9 years old, 10 to 14, etc. Now, let's take a look at the population pyramid of the United States. This is pretty standard for a developed nation, uh, certainly like a Western European nation. Notice here that we have some bulges here. So this would represent the baby boomer population. This would represent actually my uh, stage of life. So the uh, the millennials, and then we have a smaller population down here, zero to four, five to nine, etc. So people are having fewer kids. Now let's take a look at China. And here we see something pretty drastic. So with China, there's this massive bulge, you know, of 50-year-olds to 60-year-olds. You see a smaller bulge here. Again, they're um, millennials. But the problem is there's not that many young people. This is something that is absolutely horrific for countries like China, Japan. They have a rapidly aging population, and the population the next generation coming up is going to have to support them, uh, you know, either by you know, having their parents live with them or you know, support them financially uh, as they go through the latter stages of their lives. So this is actually, I mean, this is not a great thing, 
But, you know, China is going through a demographic dividend right now because a large portion of its population is working age. Ten years from now, you know, these baby boomers hope, I mean, I would expect a lot of them to be retired. You know, and, you know, you, then you're going to have a much smaller working age population. All right, the last country I want to show you is Nigeria. And here we see something totally different. Nigeria is indicative of a lot of developing nations. I mean, here it's pretty obvious. I mean, they have a massively growing population. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable the, the growth rate in the population in recent years. I mean, Lagos in Nigeria is one of the, I mean, it's one of the largest uh, cities on earth at this point. Uh, so, you know, this is something we see with developing nations. And this would be an example of a country that has a very, very young population that's likely more receptive to new fintech. Now, getting away from demographics, I think it's also important to mention the fact that we're moving away from a unipolar world where the U.S. was the dominant country toward a, a more multipolar global environment. And uh, so since the fall of the USSR, the U.S. has really been the dominant country on Earth. Other countries set policies and took actions that Washington wanted to see. However, two major competitors have been emerging in the past 30 years, the EU and China. Both of these players are more populous than the United States. They also have the ability to support homegrown firms that can compete with U.S. firms. And as we've seen during the Ukrainian war, having the ability to produce goods and services in the country rather than importing them makes a country more secure. Uh, the U.S. Congress recently passed the CHIPS Act, which was designed to support the local manufacturing of semiconductors, rather than being reliant on a supply chain that exists in Japan, Taiwan, mainland China, and other countries. Uh, other countries, notably China, have begun to ensure that they have a regional supply chain to produce goods to support national defense. So the big takeaway here is that there's been this regionalization of supply chains. As you know, we're coming out of COVID, uh, firms and governments realize that well, really, it's if, you, if your supply chain is spread out over many countries and there's a blockage in one country, your inputs for your products that you're producing will be stalled. All right, going along with you know, this, this multipolar environment, uh, it's important to note that many countries also support state-owned enterprises, or SOEs. And SOEs are firms that are at least partially owned by a government. These firms often have a shareholder value maximization objective, but they can also support the objectives of a government that supports them. For example, when former Treasury Secretary of the United States, Hank Paulson, worked for Goldman Sachs in China, he noted that many SOEs employed six times as many people as they needed. And obviously governments have this high employment objective, and this can run counter to a shareholder value maximization objective. So SOEs, in many countries, they employ far more people than they should, you know, or that is efficient. And so there's, there's this kind of mixed bag with SOE. They do receive a large amount of government support, either through favorable legislation or uh, capital infusions, but they often employ far more people than they really should, and this can actually hurt their bottom line. All right, now the final major issue I want to briefly mention is resource scarcity. Many resources are becoming more difficult to acquire. In recent years, the demand for rare earth elements like lithium and cobalt has also skyrocketed. And unfortunately, there are very few places on earth to find these minerals. This means that the lithium and cobalt that are used in batteries and solar panels often come from places with spotty human rights records like the Congo or China's Xinjiang province. Water access is also an increasing concern. As we've seen this year, Drought can have enormous consequences for populations, leading to civil unrest and population migration. Recently, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange introduced water futures, which allows traders to acquire an amount of water at a set price to offset the uncertainty of the price of water. Unfortunately, the use of futures to provide such a basic resource is likely to become much more common in the future. Lastly, we're seeing this increase in desertification leading to a smaller amount of tillable land. There are several reasons for this, including warmer temperatures, less water, and less environmentally friendly farming practices. 
Several startups have developed potential solutions to this issue, but we can certainly expect to see an increase in the number and the use of tech products that, that do help us deal with resource scarcity in coming years. Now let's turn our attention to the largest inefficiencies and opportunities in the financial industry that can be solved with simple fintech solutions. Although there are many areas of finance that are practically begging for simple innovative solutions, there are specific areas where fintech has the ability to provide enormous value to people and firms. I'll talk about a few of these here, and then I'll do a deeper dive later on in this video series. First, we have remittances, which are funds that are sent by one person to another overseas. We often talk about remittances being sent by migrant workers back to relatives in their home countries, uh, although these payments take other forms. Uh, now, the remittance industry is extremely costly in percentage terms, so historically, Western Union was one of the main ways an individual could send funds over long distances. However, the World Bank conducted a recent survey, and it found that the average cost for Western Union and its competitors to send $200 from one person to another was about $13, or 6.84%. And that's pretty high. Now, there are many substitutes or potential substitutes for Western Union and its products. The most obvious substitute would be cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency like Bitcoin allows individuals to send funds from one digital wallet to another in a few minutes at a fairly low cost in percentage terms. The funds are added to the wallet immediately, and the sender can verify that the payment occurred. So cryptocurrency, despite all of its other issues that we'll talk about in other videos, it does have some significant benefits with respect to remittances. Another area that's ripe for change is the financial advising industry. This industry is going through a transformation with the rise of robo-advisors, which are financial planning tools that provide automated advice at a fraction of the cost of traditional financial planners. There are many examples of robo-advisors, like SoFi, Wealthfront, and Betterment. I'll go through an analysis of each of them in a later set of videos. However, robo-advisors aren't appropriate for everyone. They tend to provide a one-size-fits-all recommendation, and they don't allow clients to specify unique or unusual financial goals. This is why a traditional financial planner is often better for people with more disposable income or higher net worth. Another area where there's been a lot of financial innovation in the last two decades is microloans. A microloan is a small loan made to an individual or a firm. These are often smaller than $500. So for example, a microloan might be offered to an Indian farmer so they can buy a piece of equipment that dramatically increases the amount that they can till. Now, these loans are often risky, and the people receiving them often don't have a long credit history. So microloans are often not provided by traditional financial institutions. In many cases, it's nonprofits that are servicing these loans. Even today, uh, you have firms like Kiva. Now, the growth of microloans was kicked off by a company called Grameen Bank. Uh, now, Grameen was and still is a Bangladeshi firm that began offering microloans in a fairly unique way by using social pressure to incentivize people to repay their loans. And I'll do a deeper dive into Grameen in one of my next videos, so I'll hold off the deeper discussion just for a little bit. Uh, but, you know, they've done great work, and Muhammad Yunus, who uh, founded the bank, I mean, he won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for this work. One final area that we're seeing massive changes in is the banking industry. Now, there's many competitors opening new banks and stealing potential deposits and capital from traditional banks. We often call these new competitors that provide these products and services but don't operate like traditional banks uh, either neobanks or challenger banks. A good example of a neobank or a challenger bank is SoFi. Now, SoFi offers customers practically every financial service that a traditional bank would offer. The firm rose to prominence by offering student loans, and over time, it's built out its financial products. It now works with partner banks to offer a checking account and a savings account. Uh, the partnership between SoFi and banks like Metabank, Hills Bank, and Wells Fargo is fairly common. And many traditional banks are starting to work with neobanks and challenger banks in order to reach new customers. Now, the banking space is rapidly becoming more hotly contested, with several tech firms like Google and Apple trying to offer financial products. 
The difficulty that banks face is the wealth of consumer data that these tech firms have, which represents a competitive advantage for them. This new competition is leading to an increase in mergers and acquisitions in the banking space. So let's take a look at some of the activities of some of the biggest tech firms. So, you know, when we talk about big tech firms, we have kind of the big three in China, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu. Uh, in the U.S., it's Alphabet or Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. Uh, Samsung is the leader in uh, South Korea. Microsoft is a big player. And then in South America, we have Mercado Libre. Vodafone is a U.K. company operating really a, a lot of places. Uh, in terms of the activities of a lot of these tech firms, I mean, I think it's easiest to see with Apple and Google. You know, Google has Google Pay, Apple has Apple Pay, uh, where you can, I mean, it's a, they provide a digital wallet. Uh, other companies like Amazon are starting to roll out uh, actual lending services to their clients. So if you need to get a loan, uh, maybe you need to borrow money to pay for something on Amazon, well, you might be able to get a loan. Maybe if you don't need to borrow that money for you know, an Amazon purchase, you can still get that loan. Now, other tech firms around the world are offering other products. So, I mean, I, I won't really mention it too much beyond this, but Alibaba, which we'll certainly talk about uh, later in this class, they have asset management services in the form of Yue Bao. And this is essentially the world's largest money market fund. Uh, so... Uh, a fund that you can put your money in and earn very a very small amount of interest on. Money market funds are typically, uh, you know, they hold a portfolio of short-term assets. And then there's a huge amount of insurance products being offered by by uh, big tech firms. So you, know, you can get an insurance policy from, I mean, basically everything you see here. Okay. Now, I think it's important to also mention a couple of companies that up until recently or, or over the last year or so have become incredibly prominent. Uh, so I took this data as of June 2022. Uh, some of these companies have gone defunct. I think the one that everyone's immediately going to recognize here, FTX. So right now, FTX is worth, well, zero. And this is, I, I think, one of the big issues with a lot of these big fintech firms is that you know, for their valuations blew up. I mean, people were very bullish on them, and some of them, there, there was a lot of hot air. There was, or in some cases, in uh, in the case of FTX, just outright fraud. Okay, so uh, let's start with Stripe. So Stripe, uh, this is a payment platform. They essentially allow you to use, a, they use a series of APIs, and they allow businesses to monetize their services. So, for example, uh, if you've ever used Lyft, the the payment technology used by Lyft is, is from Stripe. Uh, so Stripe allows people to use their credit card to pay for uh, a product or a service. So if you, you know, have loaded your credit card in Lyft, you're using Stripe's technology. Klarna, uh, this is one of several different buy now, pay later firms, so BNPL firms. Uh, this allows you to buy a product on credit. So you pay essentially over for payments, so you know, feel free to take a look at this at your leisure. But there's all kinds of other uh, companies like this. FTX, I mean, it's a crypto exchange. It was the largest in the world. Uh, when I was teaching this class in person, I actually avoided talking about FTX early on because I just couldn't find that much information relative to other crypto exchanges. But halfway through last semester, FTX went belly up. Now I know why there wasn't as much information on them as, say, like, uh, oh, blockchain.com or uh, crypto, uh, crypto.com or, you know, something like that. So we'll talk a lot about FTX later in this, this set of videos. The next largest fintech firm out there uh, that I've got here is Chime. And Chime is what we call a challenger bank. It's not technically a bank uh, according to the, the letter of the law in the United States. It provides an app. And then it, uh, you know, it, it essentially provides banking services. Uh, we'll dive into those later in this class. And then you have all kinds of other things like uh, OpenSea. So if you want to buy NFTs or something, you know, that's that's the big marketplace for that. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about how worthless NFTs are later in this this video series. But uh, yeah, okay. There are some others that are fairly smaller. So Block. 
formerly Square. This is a digital payment service, very similar to Plaid. Uh, PayPal, if I think ev everyone who's watching this video has probably used PayPal, uh, they allow you to es essentially make online payments, and now they own Venmo. Uh, so again, I'll talk about them in detail later in this video series. Robinhood, another very important fintech firm. Mint, it's something that I use uh, on my own personal behalf. And then Coinbase is another crypto exchange. It's actually far better than FTX was. Hindsight bias bears that out. <laughs> okay, now before I wrap up this video, I wanted to discuss a few traditional firms that were investing in fintech. However, as I looked for good examples, I found that practically every single blue chip financial firm has made or is in the process of making some investments in fintech. Uh, for example, Goldman Sachs is acquiring several fintech firms. Visa has a fast track program that allows startups to work with them and then access Visa's credit card network. American Express is offering something similar. And so the best thing that I can say about traditional financial firms making tech investments is that everybody is doing it and they're doing it in slightly different ways but there's this massive investment on behalf of traditional firms into fintech. So maybe it's best that I, I cut off that discussion for right now. So let's summarize. There's a huge number of factors driving fintech adoption. I think the most prominent ones are the ones I discussed. So climate change, geopolitical issues, technological adva advancement, demographics, and resource scarcity. Uh, I also talked about the largest fintech firms and the, some of the products they offer. Uh, and then also the lines between traditional financial firms and fintech firms ha have really been blurred in recent years as traditional financial firms acquire fintech firms and start to incorporate that new technology into their own operations. So with that, I'm going to bring this video to an end, and I hope you enjoyed it, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.